So I'm at University of Maryland School of Medicine. I'm an associate professor uh, there. I've been there almost nine years now. Um, and I did my initial training um, on viruses uh, with a guy named Ralph Barrick, who's a premier coronavirus, viral, coronavirus scientist at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, and the, I left there working on SARS. And then um, I'll tell you a little bit of how we got into MERS as it comes. I'm one initial come. All right. So first, um, welcome to the wonderful world of virology. So hopefully, um, <laughs> you will be learning a lot about um, both SARS, MERS, and other viruses as we go um, uh, through the talk. Uh, and again, please interrupt me. I love the, the studying viruses. I think they are um, these little bits of evolution that have are way smarter than we are. And we use them in the lab, one, to understand the viruses, but two, to really understand what they processes uh, they interact with in the cell. And by understanding how the viruses interact with things in our body, our immune system, individual proteins in our cells, um, we learn a lot of, more about the cells than really we do about the viruses. So they've really evolved to this really amazing um, uh, interconnectedness between us. And whether it's acute kind of new viruses that are jumping um, from animals to people, like we'll talk about Bruchard and MERS, or whether they're highly evolved viruses that have been here forever, um, uh, the, like all of the retrotransposons that are in all of our chromosomes, um, we can learn a lot about both of them, whether they're acute or chronic. OK. So um, these viruses, are, I think, are interesting in the context of kind of this finding, which is basically over the last 60 years, there's been this emergence of zoonotic viruses. So, Zoonotic means jumping from animal to people or animal origin. And they've jumped basically across um, a variety of places all around the world. So this is just some of them. Um, everything from Machupo in Bolivia, a hemorrhagic fever virus in the 60s, uh, to uh, Ebola, which originally was identified in 1976 uh, in Africa. But as we know, and all of you heard it in the news, has come back um, in the last several years. There's Nipah and Hendra virus, which are both um, Nipah is in Malaysia. It went from uh, pigs to uh, bats to pigs to humans. Um, if anyone saw a contagion, that was kind of based off of Nipah. Um, you have um, Hendra virus, which is another crazy virus. Um, it's a, in the same family as Nipah virus, but it goes from these giant fruit bats to horses. And then when the horses die in the field, the veterinarians go and treat the horses, and then they get the virus from the horses that way. Um, uh, you have SARS, which emerged in 2003 in China, which we'll talk about. And then MERS, uh, which emerged in 2012 in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, KSA, in, um, in the Middle East. And the big worry about all these viruses is that, especially MERS or, or, or SARS or respiratory viruses, is that someone gets on a plane from where, they're, where they originate from and then travel around the world and go to their, their, either the place they came from or a new country, and they bring the virus with them and thinking they only have a cold. And so this is the big problem with this family of viruses, these coronaviruses. Um, is that they look more or less the early stages of the infection, just like the common cold. Um, and it isn't until later that you realize you have this new emerging virus, this new virus that can, uh, is very lethal. OK. Hope this works. So um, this is a legitimate problem, and it's happened over and over again for MERS and SARS. Uh, and this was modeled by this guy at Northwestern. Um, it's just a video I stole from his website. Um, it models basically a emerging virus outbreak. It looks like basically every terror, like horrible virus movie you've ever seen. Um, so it the it starts with a outbreak of a virus in Atlanta, which is kind of funny, and then it spreads <laughs> all around the world um, to every major city by the by plane. And in this model, it takes 53 days to hit every major city in the world. Kind of amazing. Um, this was not, if I remember right from his study, uh, this was not a super transmissible virus. It was a moderately transmissible uh, respiratory virus, which is kind of the point of his study, um, to show that it is completely legitimate that this could happen in a very fast network um, uh, for a virus that you may not even know is there. OK. So let's start um, uh, with a story about SARS. So. Um, the first time anyone heard about SARS was uh, this ProMed post um, on February 10th, 2003. So ProMed, if anyone doesn't know what it is, it's a website where um, 
every day they have announcements of emerging pathogens or reports of weird pathogens in the world. Um, and so this was a post that was in 2003, and, and this is this very um, uh, simple email, simple note. It says, this morning I received an email and then searched your archives and found nothing that pertained to it. Does anyone know anything about it? And this is quoting this email he got, which says, have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that hospitals there have been closed and people are dying. Now, if you follow ProMed, these things happen a lot. You hear, you see these kind of strange reports all the time, but this was what turned out to be SARS. So the basic uh, story of SARS starts here. So this is February 2003, um, where uh, it starts with this uh, Chinese doctor working in the Guangdong province of China. Um, he traveled to Hong Kong, and he checked into room 911, a little weird, um, at the Metropole Hotel. Okay, so in all the studies, it's called Hotel M, but it's the Metropole Hotel. Um, and so this was February 21st, 2003. On the 22nd, he felt sick. He went to the hospital um, and was admitted to the ICU. And then he died a little over a week later on March 4th, 2003. Um, from, at the time, an unknown disease, some, just some kind of uh, uh, respiratory disease that, was, that they didn't identify. So after the fact, um, the epidemiologist went to the Metropole Hotel. Um, they looked at the floor he was living on. So this is a study that was published um, uh, in 2004, where they basically went to his room in green here, which is room 911, and they swabbed the hallways, they swabbed doorknobs uh, around the elevator and the stairwells, um, and then they sampled the people that were in this hotel at the time that they could get to. And what they found was that, one, this is his room 911, um, in red are the places that, where they swabbed and they found uh, SARS positive samples at those areas. So right at the side of his room and right in front of the stair, um, in front of the stairs. And in blue are all the places where they were either confirmed or um, or possible infections from these uh, that had SARS. And so what it shows you one is that the, for whatever reason this person was very highly contagious and spread the virus around this room, around this floor. No one knows what he did, how he interacted with the people at the time, but he clearly had a very high shedding rate and was transmitting it to these people around him. Okay, so now um, back to our timeline here. So that was, now we're February 23rd, okay? So um, if you remember here, the 21st is when this guy was staying at, hotel, at, at the Metropole Hotel. So on the 23rd, a businessman named Johnny Chen, really his name, um, traveled to Hanoi, Vietnam, and he had stayed out on the ninth floor at the Metropole Hotel. So three days later, he's in Hanoi, he feels sick, he goes to the French hospital in Hanoi, and he's seen by a infectious disease specialist there, um, who then uh, calls his friend who works at WHO, who is an even a higher level ID doc, um, named Carla Urbani, and he says, I think you should come see this guy. So Dr. Urbani goes and um, investigates his patient. Um, a little over a week later, he's evacuated Hong Kong for treatment. Um, and then a little week after that, this Johnny Chen uh, patient dies. And so before he dies, Dr. Urbani, who had been working for the WHO, um, he alerted them and said, from all the reports that he was seeing, there was this massive, potential massive spread of what they're calling an atypical pneumonia um, that was spreading in Hong Kong and China. And so it wasn't until now, the, the March 15th, that the WHO alerted all of the network hospitals that they connect with around the world, um, and they got reports back from a number of them. And they said, so far, there's 150 suspected cases of what they were calling severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, which is an atypical pneumonia. And they had reports coming from all over the world, China, Canada, uh, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Um, and uh, that everyone at these hospitals in the, these cities around the world should be looking for a different type of lung disease, different type of pneumonia than what was normally seen. Okay, oops. Um, so unfortunately, two weeks later, Dr. Urbani dies from the same virus that he was identified in this patient. Um, so it was, uh, um, Every year during his birthday, there's a big announcement that um, uh, commemorating his 
devotion to infectious diseases. Um, and actually, the strain of SARS in the lab that we use uh, is the Urbani strain. So it's actually from his uh, swabs from when he was a patient, too. OK. Um, so oh, sorry, it's not coming up correctly. Go here. So if you look um, across the uh, outbreak of SARS, if you look at the probable or the, or sorry, the spelled probable cases of SARS um, over time, there seem to be around a little over 8,000 cases um, around the world and uh, a little under 800 deaths. So around almost a 10% case fatality rate, which is quite high. Flu is generally in the couple 2 to 3% per year on average. Um, you can also see that there is a um, biphasic curve here. There seems to be an early level of infection. This is number of cases over time. Um, and then it really ramps up to be highly transmissible um, throughout the course of infection. The really amazing thing about SARS is that um, it spread around the world in around nine months, and then it went away and has not come back, more or less. So um, we'll talk about the more or less part in a second. So the, uh, the ability for this virus to really go to 27 or 28 countries around the world um, in such a small time and then to be contained is not the, the containment was not because of any type of, um, of vaccine or drug or any special thing that was developed in the lab at the time. It was really all epidemiologists. They, people who got sick, they were quarantined um, either in hospitals or they stayed home. And then they either died or they got better. And that was blocking the virus. The understanding the reservoir was also important. We'll talk about that too. Um, but really, it was all epidemiology that blocked and contained uh, the people where they were infected so they didn't spread it anymore. OK. Um, one of the kind of interesting things that came out of the lab after the fact was that um, if you, this is uh, time here, oops and number of cases on the y-axis. Uh, in late 2002, what was identified was that there was an animal origin of this virus. We'll talk about that in a second, uh, too. And the early people that were infected had this virus that seemed to come from animals. Um, and uh, when you look at the sequence of the virus, you can tell that it looks like the virus that was identified in animals, which I'll tell you about in a second, but it's, I like that part of the story, too. And it wasn't until later where the virus mutated and got to humans that it really ramped up. Um, and then there's the interesting thing, there's this peak later, um, which was also animal, uh, with an animal origin. Um, and, and it was identified in the people and then sequenced and identified to really be from the animal reservoir, not from a new outbreak of the uh, in humans. OK. I know. I'm going to tell you about the animal reservoir in a second. Don't spoil it. Yes. Uh, from the animal to the human. So it's very similar. It's 99% plus identical between the two. Um, really, the, the important part is the, the proteins that the virus uses to bind to the cell, the, that spike protein, which on the surface I'll show you a picture of, um, that is the critical determinant of entry. And it looks like that is the thing that mutated during the epidemic. So it replicated, initially replicated better in, in animals. Um, and didn't replicate as well in humans. And then once it mutated this interface a bit, it now replicates much better in humans than it did originally. These are epithelial cells, yeah, in the lungs. I'll show you a picture in a second. OK. So the other origin story here is MERS. So um, this story now is 10 years later. So everyone, while we worked on, Mer on SARS in the lab and people wrote grants and papers, we always said that, um, this is on tape, I think, right? So we always said that. Uh, we were predicting that we were working on SARS because this thing could happen again. There could be another highly pathogenic coronavirus that was out there. We didn't know yet, but we have to understand everything we can about SARS so we can be ready for MERS. Um, whether we believe that or not, I don't really know, but there was evidence that it was out there. There was other things out there that were probably going to come. Um, and then in 2012, um, when I was uh, in the lab, I had my own lab for about three years, and was finally getting my feet under me and learning how to run a lab and understanding how to manage people and, and, and keep my wits about me, um, we got a curveball, which was this case report, uh, another ProMed report. So this, in this report, it was a 60-year-old man um, who presented with pneumonia and renal failure. Um, it was uh, the doctor who was in charge, of this, in charge of this patient, did all the standard tests like you would at Georgetown or Hopkins or University of Maryland um, for any other respiratory viruses that they would normally see, and they were all negative. So um, the story with this patient is that it was in Saudi Arabia this time and not China. 
Um, and uh, the doctor who was in charge of this patient, Dr. Zaki, um, thought that it was a strained presentation. He didn't know what it was. And he apparently uh, contacted, the story is that he contacted a doctor in Erasmus in the Netherlands, Erasmus University, and said, I have the sample. Can I send it to you? Can you, look, can you sequence it and see if there's anything different? Um, and according to him, he asked the Saudi government if that was OK. And they said, yeah, 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 no, don't worry about it. So they sent it out. It turned out to be something different now. And so at the same time it was being sequenced, the, the group in Erasmus, um, Ron Fouché, said, why don't you test a couple primer sets by PCR, so amplify it in the lab, and see if it comes up positive with something else. Um, and so we did that, and it turned out that it was a coronavirus that worked, the prime PCR set that worked. So they detected it was a coronavirus. The lab in Erasmus identified the coronavirus, sequenced it, and identified this new, um, this new virus now, which was similar to SARS, but in a different family. And so that virus was um, ultimately called human coronavirus EMC for Erasmus Medical College, which turned into a whole debacle. So then they renamed it um, uh, for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS. Um, Dr. Zaki, the patient, the doctor who was in charge of the patient, um, uh, eventually got ran out of Saudi Arabia and took his, he was Egyptian, took his family with him to back to Egypt. Um, and because the Saudis, the Saudi government apparently did not uh, like that Erasmus was now naming their vi this virus that came from their country and taking all the rights and legal rights to the sequence of the virus for um, uh, detection and assays and things. So he got in a little trouble. Um, but ultimately, uh, uh, I think it turned out OK, I guess. Um, since then, so since 2012, September 2012, there's been a little over 2,100 cases, um, uh, a little under 800 deaths. The really remarkable thing about MERS is that the case fatality rate is around 35%, which is really hot. It's a very, very lethal virus, um, which we still don't really understand why. Um, over time, there's been, this is an epi curve here, number of cases, again, versus time over the last, this goes to the end of 2017. Um, early on, there was only about a dozen or two dozen cases um, uh, through the end of 2012 that were identified. All of them primarily in Saudi Arabia. Um, in dark blue is Saudi Arabia, and in light blue is other countries. Um, and what you see is over time, you see these peaks of uh, infections. And all of these peaks are nosocomial infections. They're hospital-acquired infections. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the idea basically is that the, a single person got infected outside of the hospital, went to the hospital for treatment, and then infected other people there. And it became a rampant infection that was then spread by patients and doctors. And it was basically an uncontrolled infectious disease inside these local hospitals. Um, and it wasn't until the, it's not until those are recognized and controlled that then those, that a little mini outbreak was uh, eliminated. And then something really, and, and so during this time, there was a lot of travel related um, infections where someone would go to the Middle East for travel or to go for religious reasons, for pilgrimage, and then go back to their country of origin. So it happened from England and France and um, all over the Middle East to Oman and, and um, Egypt and Tunisia. And all of these times, there were these little outbreaks where people would go to, the middle, to Saudi Arabia and then back to their country. And then they would have local transmission events in their country of origin. We had two MERS patients in the United States. Both of them were doctors treating patients in Saudi Arabia. Then they um, traveled to the United States independently of each other, one um, to Florida, um, the other one to Indiana, and brought the virus with them. Luckily, there was no transmission. Um, at the time, they were identified quickly, and they, the doctors uh, that were triaging them in the hospital recognized they were from Saudi Arabia and recognized that, who knows, maybe they have MERS, and it turned out they had MERS. Um, so they put them under quarantine, and there was no transmission. Right after these two events happened in the US, um, Ebola landed in Dallas, and then everyone forgot about MERS. So um, we had our, our shining moment, and that was it. Um, one of the interesting things here is this red peak here. And so this was one of the more, um, I think, uh, enlightening um, outbreaks. And this, this was in South Korea. And so what happened again here was the uh, same idea. A businessman from Seoul went to um, the Middle East, did business for a couple weeks, went back to, to South Korea outside of Seoul, um, and brought the virus with him. And not only did he affect himself, um, this is him here, 
but he then transmitted it to a host of people in this initial hospital he went to in, in South, South Korea. Um, there is uh, a habit um, of called doctor shopping, that's what I've been called, told it's called, where you go to your local doctor first, and then uh, if you can afford it, they then transfer you to and the next doctor up the list, and then up the line, up the line, ultimately ending in Samsung Medical Center, which is in Seoul, major medical center in South Korea. Um, and so he did this, and a along the way, he was basically seeding people to be infected. And one of the remarkable things about uh, all this epidemiological work that happened in South Korea was that the South Korean um, government and, and epi epidemiological um, scientists could track everyone by their cell phones, by the GPS. So they know every patient who was where in the hospital, whether in the ER, based on records or interviews, what hospital they were in, how long they were there, whether they were the original patient, whether they're family members. Um, and so they can make these really remarkable maps. And so you can see the initial patient here, spread it to um, about two dozen people. And then most of them are dead ends. So that's the other weird thing about these viruses. There's a lot of dead ends. There's single transmission events, and then that person doesn't transmit to anyone else. And it's not really understood why some people are these super spreaders and spread to two dozen people or just leave it to themselves, and that's it. Um, and so what you can see here is really dramatic um, infection where this one person here transmitted it to about 80 people. Um, and it's really kind of a remarkable that they, one, they can do this by GPS and by epi studies. Two, they, have, they don't have sequence on all of these viruses, but the ones they do, they can sequence the viruses and know um, by looking at the little tiny SNPs that are, occur during evolution of the virus, you can track it back to its origin of the, of the patients. Yes? I think, yes. From what I understand, they can do this and no problem. Whether it was a special rule for this outbreak scenario or not, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, sorry. The question was, do they have different privacy rules for being allowed to track cell phone technology like this or not? And I think I, they must have. I don't know if you could do this in the United States this way. Um, you could easily do interviews and know people, especially by, medical, by the um, computerized medical records now, who was where at what time. So you could at least have that data, but whether you could, log, you can't do it by cell phone like we can now, unless you have permission. Is it okay? Okay. Um, so one of the other things here, as I said, was that there's that there's 186 cases in in South Korea, 36 deaths, um, and five people responsible for over 80 85 percent of the cases. So there's as again there's this super spreader and, and super super shedder dynamic that's occurring. So somebody can. Be, um, be shedding a lot of virus, very high levels of virus out, whether it's because of coughs, whether it's because of their biology and their immune response. Um, but the people that are getting infected have to have some other issue with them as well to be able to receive that virus in a certain way to get infected. And there's plenty of people who probably are able to, are sneezed on or coughed on or in the same room with someone that has virus that's MERS positive and the virus rooming around. Um, that doesn't get infected, and we don't know the reasons for this at all. For SARS, MERS, flu, anything else. Okay, so um, over the last uh, five and a half years, there, the virus has spread to 27 countries. Uh, the vast majority are in Saudi Arabia. Why they're in Saudi Arabia, I'll give you a hint of what I think it is potentially later, um, but we don't really know why Saudi Arabia is um, the key to all of these infections. Uh, when there are animals that are positive around in the countries around Saudi Arabia, but there's no primary infections in any of those countries. Okay. The other interesting thing to me is that um, I, this is the SARS curve I put up before. Um, we don't know uh, where we are in a relative to this curve for MERS. So are we are we going to bibble along and at low levels like we are, are for MERS, where you know, we have five years and 2,000 cases. It's not super amazing um, numbers, uh, where SARS was 8,000 people in nine months. It's a different type of virus. Um, so are we at this early stage where it's an animal spreading at the moment, and um, eventually the virus will mutate enough that it will transmit better? So right now it doesn't transmit super well between people. Or um, because of the reservoir, which we'll talk about in a second, is that going to continue this low-level spread for a while? And that's just where how it's going to be. And until we 
kind of understand reservoir dynamics better and block that spread to people? Are we going to understand this and block it? Okay. All right. So now to the viruses themselves. Um, SARS is, as I said, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. MERS is Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus, um, abbreviated SARS-CoV or MERS-CoV. I will say on the script that in all the slides in the hall, in the outbreak um, hall, it's just called SARS or MERS, not SARS-CoV or MERS-CoV. In science speak, SARS is the, is the disease and SARS-CoV is the virus. Same way HIV is the virus and AIDS is the disease, um, but uh, you will be calling it SARS and MERS in the, uh, in the show. Okay. Um, the, uh, just the background on the, on the viruses, I don't, I don't remember if the nomenclature is like this um, in the, on the displays, but the order of the, the viruses are nidovirales. Um, uh, they're nidoviruses. Um, there are coronaviruses, and they're, they're a subtype of coronaviruses called beta coronaviruses. And both SARS and MERS are beta coronaviruses. There's alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses so far. Um, they look like this, where they're spherical viruses. Um, they're called coronaviruses because in Latin, the corona is crown. And so this is an electron micrograph of the virion, and it has these little projections around the, viri of, around the virus. It looks like a crown, supposedly. Um, those little projections are the spike protein, so they're called. They are what binds to the receptor of, on, on the surface of cells. Um, SARS uses ACE2 um, and a protein called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, MERS uses a protein called DPP4 for dipeptidyl peptidase 4. Um, there's other proteins in the virus that make up the virion. Uh, the genome is a RNA uh, genome for this for both these for all the coronaviruses. They're wrapped up in um, in uh, called a nucleocapsid, and that wraps up the genome inside the virus. Uh, and there's other proteins on the outside of the virus that probably aren't that important to you. Okay, this is a phylogeny of all the coronavirus or many of the coronavirus species. Um, as I said, these are alpha coronaviruses in yellow. This is the beta coronavirus lineage in oops in blue, um, gamma coronaviruses in pink, and then these um, delta or uh, coronaviruses are in uh, orange. And uh, SARS is right here. This is the, the our lethal um, beta coronavirus uh, beta clade, and this is the beta coronavirus C clade um, where MERS is. So this is there's an A, B, C, and D groups inside the beta coronavirus lineage. Um, the other part of this is that there's four other coronaviruses that infect, that are known to affect people, and they just give you a cold. They give you, they're, they're around every season. During the winter, around 30 to 70%, depending on location, of your colds that you get are coronaviruses. So they're called 229E, OC43, HK1, and sorry, it's NL63. Um, and no one's ever heard of them before. If you don't work on them, no one, they just give you a cold. Everyone thinks you have the flu or maybe an adenovirus uh, or rhinovirus is the ma major one usually. Um, but coronaviruses are increasingly recognized as being a major cause of the common cold during the year. Um, the other interesting thing um, about all of these viruses is that um, they all have different receptors they use to get into cells. But um, uh, NL63, which is right here, uses the same receptor that SARS uses. So it goes in the same place, but the backbone of the virus, the regular genome of the virus, is different enough that it doesn't cause a lethal disease. It just gives you a cold. Um, SARS and MERS are both uh, what are called BSL-3 viruses. Um, that's my grad student Carly on the right, uh, former grad student. Um, that stands for biosafety level three. So the way we work, since we know that these viruses are highly contagious, they're respiratory viruses, we work on them wearing these suits. I brought one if anyone wants to wear one later. Um, so we wear these hoods, and it hooks up to um, what's called a papper. So it has a HEPA filter on the back. It blows clean air through this hose. Let's see if it'll go. Um, through this hose, which connects to the back of the hood, and then it blows clean air over your face at all times. Um, uh, we wear these really fun uh, FedEx envelope suits. <laughs> so they're basically they're Tyvek. They feel like FedEx envelopes um, with arms and legs. And so you wear those. Uh, we wear an apron over top. We wear gloves and, and booties so that we don't get infected with the virus ourselves. Um, all of the work is done inside um, uh, a, a biosafety cabinet under um, that has a HEPA filter in it as well that's pulling in um, clean air all the time. 
or pulling in air and then circulating back so it's clean. Um, and then the room we're in is also under negative pressure. So there's ductwork that goes from the top of the room through the roof of my building with another HEPA filter on the roof. So all of the, the air that's coming into the room from the hallway is then sucked into the room and then up this ductwork out the roof of the building. So it's all safe. No virus gets out. All the virus, every time we open a tube of virus or a mouse that's infected or an animal infected with a virus, it's inside this biosafety cabinet, so it's all contained. Um, and it isn't a terrible place to work, I promise. So the other really kind of amazing thing about SARS and MERS is where they come from. This is my favorite part. So um, this gets to this idea of reservoir being a really big, important part of both of these viruses, as well as all of the other emerging viruses that I showed you on that first slide. So SARS emerged in, in China, um, the Guangdong province. Um, what they found was that in, when the scientists recognized this virus was out there, they started looking where it com could come from. And so they went to these wet markets, um, which are basically uh, uh, live animal markets where they sell everything you could ever think of that's alive and then kill it there for you. Um, and when scientists went and looked at these workers that were in the wet markets and they tested them for antibodies against SARS, they found a large percentage of them, around 10% of them had antibodies against SARS. So clearly they were being interacting with this virus uh, at some level. And then they went and looked in the animals that were in the wet markets. Um, and they found that these things called civet cats, which are right here, um, they're kind of ferret looking raccoony things. Um, they were very, they were positive for the virus as well, or a virus that looked like the human isolate of SARS. It wasn't the same, it wasn't identical, but it looked like the human isolate of SARS. Um, again, 98 to 99% identical between the two viruses. Um, but the interesting thing about the civet cats is that they got sick. They got snotty, they started, they were dying from the, they were sick from the virus. So they weren't really the natural reservoir because if you saw outbreak and you saw the monkey in the movie, same idea where you can't be the natural reservoir if you die from the virus. You want to be the animal that survives and lives. And you can be the monkey from Outbreak who then Cuba Gooding Jr. takes your blood and then in a day in a van, he saves the whole village by um, making as much antibody as possible. Um, but civets are interesting in China because they're not only uh, used for food, they're used for coffee. So um, there's a thing called civet coffee, Kopi Luwak, um, which is the most expensive coffee in the world. So, <laughs> What they do is they feed uh, coffee cherries, which is the picture, actually, this thing here. These are coffee beans um, from, the, from bushes. And they raise them on farms. They put the coffee cherries in front of the civet cats. They eat them, just like a good civet cat. And then they, they digest them, and they poop them out. And then they collect the poop. They wash it off a little bit. Um, and then they roast it. And then you make, apparently, very lovely coffee. Um, and you can buy this in the US. There's a company called Animal Coffee. Um, there's another one company called Cat Coffee, which has simulated the uh, digestive juices of a civet cat, but in a lab. And then they treat the coffee beans with that civet, synthetic civet juice. Um, and it apparently tastes the same. I have not taste tested either. What? Uh, this, Kopi Luwak is the original, real name. The, one in the, the other one in the US is called Cat Coffee with a K. It's like catcoffee.com, I think. I have no stock in the company. I have no, nothing to share. <laughs> um, but OK, so we know that civet cats are important. So what the Chinese government did was they said, OK, no civet cats in the cities at all. Wet markets, they said, kill everything in the wet markets. You cannot have civet cats. You can't make them restaurants. They're a delicacy. You can buy them there, and they, they would um, cook them as, um, as a delicacy in, in all over China. There's no more civet cat eating anywhere. The interesting thing is the farm civet cats were negative for the virus. Only the city civet cats in the wet markets were positive. So they were getting it somewhere along the way or in the wet markets that no one really understood. Um, so this was important here because the reservoir is these, are these civet cats, which they could, um, they could block, right? So they know the civets are probably that interface species between humans and the virus. So they went further out in the countryside, and they looked around caves. Um, they, they basically swabbed everything that moved as they went farther outside of the cities. They landed in these caves outside of um, Hong Kong. And they found bats. And they found a whole series of bats. But really, the bat that was important were these things called Chinese horseshoe bats. There's a nice picture of them there. Um, and they swabbed the bats. And they found SARS. And they found a SARS-like virus in bats. And so um, again, this virus was 99% identical to what was seen in SARS-ish. Um, but when it was, uh, they tried to isolate it at the time. 
um, from a live virus from, these, from the bat samples. They couldn't get live virus. But they knew they could sequence the virus. And they sequenced the spike thing on the outside of the virus I showed you before. And they put that on another virus and said, OK, can that spike from the bat SARS-like virus infect human cells? And it couldn't. It could infect bat cells. It could infect civet cells, but it couldn't infect human cells. And so they said, OK, well, it had to evolve and go into civets first. Civets are this intermediate reservoir, and then it jumped from civets to people, and that's probably how it worked. Um, so that was the whole idea, until a little bit later when um, uh, a set of scientists, uh, including Lin Fa Wang, who's a famous bat um, virus scientist, Peter Daszak, who's from EcoHealth, who I think there's pictures of him um, in, the, in the display, and then uh, Jonathan Epstein, who's not, oh, he is right here. He's going to be one of the guys in the pictures who has like a giant, um, one of the giant fruit bats. He's like letting it free. It's on one of the pictures, I believe. Um, uh, he's in every picture of a guy holding a bat, letting it free of the giant bat. It's always John. Um, so what they did is they went back to the same caves. And this was published um, uh, about four or five years ago now. And they went back to the same caves and isolated virus from the same type of bats that were in these places. And this time, they grew virus out. And they didn't just grow it out. They grew it on human cells. And they now could identify a virus that infected human cells. And it uses ACE2, just like regular SARS does. It has backbone mutations in the rest of the genome that more or less look like the old virus, but now has a couple new ones that maybe that look like a new, the uh, next kind of a little evolved more than what it is now, than what it was before. Um, and whether it was there before or not, nobody really knows. But at least now we know there's a virus back in the caves where SARS probably originally came from that looks and smells and acts just like human SARS and is able to infect human cells. So the wrong bat getting in touch with the wrong person could repopulate an epidemic again. So this is the um, idea for SARS here, where it was originally there was a bat virus that was spreading around bats. There was low level um, potential transmission to humans directly um, as based on this paper, but probably went through civet cats where it evolved um, to then spread to humans. And once it was in humans, um, that person went to the hospital. You had other contact in the community. You had hospital spread. And this virus then spread very well. SARS was actually very high um, uh, uh, transmission rate. The r naught, which is the transmission rate, was probably around 2, 1.8 or 2. So every one person got infected, it infected two other people um, on average. Um, and so since 2004, um, there had been no new cases of SARS. There is still no approved therapy for SARS. There's been a lot that's developed in the lab, a lot that have, um, that have possibility of going um, into people. But since there's no cases, it's hard to develop them into, into uh, FDA-approved drugs. Um, there's a lot of active research going on now about why the virus is so lethal. Um, we still don't really know, honestly. We know that there are certain mutations, certain proteins in the virus that um, hyperactivate or inhibit parts of the immune response. We know that the virus goes into the cells of animal models or uh, in mice or in monkeys and causes a lot of damage. And that damage triggers unique responses in the host, whether it's the repair process in the lungs or whether it's the immune response in the lungs um, that trigger this uh, really dramatic inflammatory response and, and uh, damage scenario that leads to uh, death in these animals. Um, but we don't really exactly know what is the crux of what makes this the worst uh, so severe. Um, and then as I showed you, this new bat virus data suggests that this zoonotic transmission can really po be possible in the future. Um, and, hope, and people are now working on more drugs and more therapeutics to really be prepared for the next one that comes. OK. Yes? Why do you think there's been no cases? What do you think? So the civet cats have been allowed back in. They can come back. So that was like by the end of the epidemic in 2004, that was allowed back in. Um, I personally, I think that the there is very little human to bat interaction, really. And I think it was the wrong bat interacted with the wrong civet at the wrong time, and then that then spread this whole thing out. And if that same scenario is to happen again, it may be happening right now. The chances of that virus following the same path to get to us is one in a million, maybe. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that ratio is, but the, the, that there's such a low level probability of that happening 
that um, we have to be prepared for it. But I think that's probably the real reason that there isn't that, uh, that much there. With deforestation, people moving into areas where they weren't before, interacting with bats potentially more than they used to be, that could easily lead to more infections in the future. Yeah, so I didn't talk about the whole Canada side, but there was an outbreak in Toronto as well. Again, the same idea. A, a doctor, actually a doctor from Toronto, went to Hong Kong for vacation, came back to Toronto, got sick, went to deal with his patients, and basically was the responsible for shutting down Toronto for about six months. Um, uh, and we didn't have any outbreaks of SARS in the United States at the time. We had patients that were positive, but no, th there were positive cases and probable cases, but not transmission. Um, I mean, I think, that, I think the Toronto outbreak shows that it could happen anywhere, again. Just like I'm going to tell you about MERS. It's, it, happens, um, it, it happens over and over again. We probably don't recognize that it's there most of the time, right? There could easily be these strange respiratory viruses or strange infections going on that we don't even know are there that get treated and then the person's fine. So the, the comment is that the procedure in the U.S. and the hospitals are more stringent for infectious disease control than they are in, in they were in Toronto or Canadian hospitals, and I, I don't I don't know if that's true. I don't I don't I would think that if you take all the hospitals in the United States, the way uh, across the board, there's going to be a very wide spectrum of infectious disease control, um, and I think that it's just chance, really. That that's it. Right, so the, um, the idea there is that the, the spike protein is basically like a lollipop, and the, so the tip of the lollipop binds to the receptor, and so the interface is where there's mutations that you can map that mutated during the evolution of the virus from bats to civets to humans. There's a couple other mutations in the genome that also are important, probably important, but the key one is, gonna, is, um, is thought to be this interface that, that's, that is the key determinant of tropism. Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, so uh, I don't think we know of anybody who was reinfected to be able to test that. But I know in animals, if you infect them with SARS and they recover and they don't you do a sublethal infection or attenuated virus, um, they are protected for the future. So they do develop antibodies that will protect them from future infection. How long those develop and how long those last um, really depends on the person, the animal, what the immune response of that person is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So for the other, for regular coronaviruses, the other four, you can get infected in one season and get infected with another, the same virus again in the next season. And we, there really is very little, very little research being done on the other coronaviruses that give you a cold because they don't really make you that sick. Um, so NIH doesn't really care that much. Um, if anyone is here from NIH wants to fund me to do this, we're working on the lab, I'd love to do it. Um, but there clearly is a very high rate of transmission of these viruses in the wild. We're doing a study now, which I didn't talk about. It in the, I'm not going to talk about it in the talk, but um, there's where we're we have a we're looking at virus transmission in the dorms in College Park, University of Maryland, um, and so we have a freshman dorm. This is through a guy named Don Milton, who's in the Epi program there. It's funded by DARPA, um, and they want to understand what makes someone a super spreader. That's the whole point of the project. But what we're doing what we're doing that part of it, I promise. Um, but to get there, we're studying uh, freshman undergrads in these three floors of a dorm, and uh, when they get sick, they come into the, his clinic, they get swabbed, and then they give us the list of their friends. And then we call their friends and say, come into the clinic, and then we follow them every day, and then look to see if they get the same thing that the first person had. And now we're trying to understand what the virus looks like between the two people, what the immune response is, what the environment is. He's really interested in, in airflow, in rooms and buildings, and how you engineer that, that limiting transmission out of a room, basically. Why bats? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so, uh, so I'll show you for murders. We think it's bats also as well. Um, so bats are really amazing. So 20% um, of all mammals are bats, right? Um, which is, I, that number still staggers me. Species, yeah. Uh, sorry, not animal species. 
Um, bats have a really remarkable, we're learning more about them now. Bats have a really remarkable immune system. So what the current theories are that um, the innate immune response in bats, so the thing that, that is the, um, the first level defense when a virus infects any animal, the innate immune response, this interferon response. Um, in bats, they seem to be, the, the basal level is higher than in humans. And so the idea is that bats can harbor these viruses at a pretty much low level and um, not get sick for them for some other reason we don't really know, but also the viruses are able to live there and not clear it. So it's this, they can maintain this lower level of infection over time, which we're not really sure about how, but it looks like it's this innate immune response that seems to be part of this trigger. Um, why bats and not another animal, I don't know. They're obviously are ancient animals. They've been around um, uh, for millennia. And the, they've clearly evolved ways of protecting themselves from these viruses. I haven't seen any data for them getting a benefit from it at all, no. Um, maybe, maybe the, bat, the, the viruses trigger some immune response in them, which then protects them from something else. And maybe that's part of it. Um, but I'll show you on here, like all of the other things that are here, they're BT, their name um, on this, in this phylogeny, which is only a minimal phylogeny, are all bat virus, bat coronaviruses that people identified. So when SARS emerged, people said, wait, it's in, there's stuff in bats, we should go swab every bat butt we can find. And then they found tons of viruses everywhere. So we, I was on a study with a former lab, member of my uh, postdoc lab, Eric Donaldson. We went in Western Maryland, we had a bat ecologist there, and he trapped bats for us. Um, basically caught them as they came. He was, a, he was doing it anyway for his counting studies. Um, he caught the bats in out of the, as they came out of this abandoned train tunnel. Um, uh, at night, he put them in a paper bag. They poop. That's what bats do. They fly around eating poop. Um, we collected the poop. We sequenced all of the RNA that was in the, in the poop. And we identified two new human coronavirus or bat coronaviruses in bats, just in, Appala in we call them Appalachian Ridge 1 and 2, Appalachian Ridge coronavirus 1 and 2. Now, do they infect humans? We don't know. We've never figured it out. Um, there was a whole lot of other viruses that we found by just mass sequencing of those samples. Um, so they, they harbor all these things. They, there was fruit viruses there. There was bumblebee and insect viruses. Some of them were probably just from the poop they were eating and then pooping them out. Um, uh, some of them may be inf infectious of the bats. We don't know. We've never been able to do that kind of quarantine and transmission study that way. Yeah. Wow, OK. So there is this idea of using, um, so the question is, is there ever reports of uh, using the antibodies from survivors to protect other people or, or, or um, clear the virus and people are infected? And so that's been used, it's, it's called IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin. It's been used um, uh, for a lot of other viruses since then. It's been proposed to be used, for, it was used for Ebola and, and avian flu, and, it's, and it's, the idea is being used for a lot of other things where you take survivor sera and you give it to someone else. I don't, they may have been used at low levels in, in SARS. I don't, remember, I don't remember any reports of that being used and seeing clinical studies on it. But um, uh, the ability to take antibodies from someone's infected, mass produce them, and then give them as a therapeutic is something that we do for a lot of viruses in the lab and try to use as a therapeutics. And we've done it for MERS, done it for SARS, and we've done it for Ebola and flu and all kinds of other viruses too. OK. Good. Thanks. That was great. All right, so now to MERS. So um, I told you a little bit about MERS, the disease, the virus before. One of the really cool things about MERS I, I like this, is about the transmission. Um, so it goes to this idea of this interconnectedness between people and the environment and the animals that are around them. So again, MERS is thought to be from bats as well, at least the parent viruses. Um, there was one study, um, there's been a series of studies, but the first one was done by a group, um, again, Peter Dozik is right here, um, and then uh, Ziad Memish is the, was the Deputy Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia. He's the first author. And then again, John Epstein. See, I told you he'd be everywhere. Um, he's on here as well. And so what they did is they went to Saudi Arabia soon after the um, MERS was identified and said, we want to sample bats. Bats are probably going to be the cause of this virus. And so what they did is they went and sampled bats. Um, the story behind this paper was that they went and collected about 250 samples, uh, bat samples, and, and a couple other animals. 
They put them on dry ice. They shipped them back to um, Ian's lab at Columbia University. And they got stuck in, um, in customs at LaGuardia. The dry ice dried, uh, dried up. They went away, evaporated. Um, and so he got warm samples back in the lab. And they were all degraded. So he, he, he extracted all the RNA he could. Um, they tried to sequence them as much as they could. And out of the samples, 200 or so samples, one sample was positive for a sequence that was identical to MERS that was seen in people. And so this is the phylogeny. Again, all these different coronaviruses here. And they see MERS showing up um, in their samples. So one of the questions we have throughout the whole thing is that, so that you can see this is his, um, these are the samples that were identified at the time. This is his bat sample right here on the top. And this is the EMC 2012, which is the original strain of MERS that was identified um, uh, from in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> um, so it's exactly 100% identical between the two. It's 180 bases or so of the sample of the sequence. The only time it's been seen in bats that have been tested, there haven't been that many studies in Saudi Arabia or other countries around the Middle East that have found, that have looked for MERS, but the ones that have have not seen it. Um, but the idea is that it's probably a bat virus. All coronavirus seem to stem from bats at some level. But it's probably, again, not the link to people because humans and bats don't really interact that much. OK. So the trick uh, to MERS was found uh, initially by this study, published in 2013. Um, so in this group, uh, so after uh, that study with Ian Lipkin, um, uh, it was hard to get into Saudi Arabia from a lot of researchers. I've, I've never gone to Saudi Arabia, but um, from what I understand, people who are trying to get into Saudi Arabia, they had problems. Um, so what this group at Erasmus did was they said, we don't need Saudi Arabia. We can go to Oman. They're welcoming us in. They were, these group was from the Netherlands. They had an interaction already. So they went to Oman and said, hey, can we st sample your camels and other animals that are there? Um, and so they did. And they took Sira from the animals. And they used um, a technique, which we don't want you to talk about, but basically they looked for the level of antibodies to MERS and a couple other coronaviruses in the serum. And what they found was that when they looked at sheep and cows and goats, um, this is the amount of antibody on the y-axis here. The lower number here is, is less antibody. Upper, oops, upper is high a lot, is a lot of antibody. They looked for SARS, OC43, which is that human coronavirus I told you about, one of the other ones that gives us a cold. It looks just like um, bovine coronavirus as well. Um, at least at the antibody level, so you get cross-reaction with the bovine one, um, or MERS. And so in sheep, in cows, and in goats, you don't see really any responses at all. They looked in other camelids, like um, alpaca and llama. Um, they saw a couple positives for this OC43, which is probably this bovine coronavirus, but nothing for MERS. And we'll skip over that one for now. Um, but they went to Oman, and they looked in the camels, and they found that 50 out of 50 of their camels had MERS antibodies. Um, they also had the bovine coronavirus, OC43 as well, but 100% of them had MERS antibodies. So give them the idea that maybe camels were the important link, and there's about 7 million camels at a time in, in Saudi Arabia, um, even more across the Middle East. So maybe camels were the link to this story about MERS. Um, the, other, the funny part of this paper was that they looked in the Canary Islands. They thought that would be an off group, an out group that would be a control set of isolated camels on an island um, uh, in uh, off of Africa, and they found MERS antibodies in about a dozen camels there, too. And so apparently, the camels that were on Canary Islands came from Africa in the 60s on a ship. There was like uh, three or four pairs of, of camels that came there. Um, and they had to have, obviously, some level of MERS in them at the time. And so this group has gone to Africa and started doing sampling across Africa and found MERS antibodies in camels all over Africa as well. So it looks like that it, the virus is really from Africa and transmitted by camels through the Middle East, and then now it's endemic across the Middle East. So that was just antibody. Um, they looked, again, in Egypt to look for antibodies as well. This is a different group from Malik Pyrrhus. Um, he looked in, in goats and sheep, in humans, and water buffaloes, and cows and camels. And again, only um, camels had antibodies against the virus. So out of um, oh, it was 110 camels they looked at, 103 were positive. So again, a very, very high rate of camels were antibodies against MERS. Yeah? So there have been studies on bats in Africa. Um, the, as far as I those are ongoing now. Um, I, I've seen really low numbers of positive samples here and there, but I don't know exactly. I think it's questionable whether they actually can find it there or not. 
there's been no, no human infections in Africa that have been identified, no people dying from MERS and outbreaks or anything. Why? No one knows. Um, so that was antibodies. And then there was another, a whole another series of studies, which was one of them, looking for the actual virus, so viral RNA and live virus in camels across Saudi Arabia. And basically every place they looked, they found camels. Uh, they found virus in these camels. Um, the story behind the, the other part of the story with camels is that it looks like there's an age dependence. So young camels seem to be virus positive, so under two years of age, before they get weaned from their mom, are virus positive, um, and antibody negative, or at least low. And then once they become adults, after two years of age, they become antibody positive and then virus negative. That's generally across what they, what they found. I um, mean, this happens in multiple studies. Now, how the young camels get infected in the first place, no one really knows. There must be some low level infection in the adults that then is seeding it in the, in the, um, in the young camels. When, uh, just like in humans, when, when the female camels are pregnant, they have a reduced immune response. There may be a way for the virus to grow out in the adults and they spread to the young camels, um, but that is not exactly understood at the moment, and those dynamics of how that's spread around, ca around camels is not known. Okay. So what a lab in the United States did, crazy enough, was they bought camels, and they, this is at a, a, a lab at Colorado State University in uh, Dick Bowen's lab, um, and what they did was they bought camels at an animal market in the United States, they have a BSL-3 that can has, have camels. And I was trying to get the video of, of, um, of them doing the infection. It's really kind of amazing the way they swab them. But it's a room, I don't know, maybe a third of this size, straw on the floor, white walls. They're, you can see their gloved hand here. They're wearing the same suit that we wear in our lab. But now they're chasing around camels instead of flicking tubes in the BL-3. Um, so they, they did primary infection in camels. So they took MERS that we grew in the lab, um, uh, infected camels intranasally with the virus and then followed it um, for a series of days. And so they did nasal washes, and this is just one part of the paper where they, um, the bigger bars are more virus uh, and viral RNA. And what they found was that, um, one, the camels could be infected. Um, they got this snotty upper respiratory tract infection in the camels. They didn't get sick other than this snotty um, nose thing. Um, and then eventually, uh, the level of virus kind of tailed off, and this is, oops, this is going on a month, 35 days, before they ended the experiment, OK? So camels are easily infectable at the primary level. They've done this also for alpacas and llamas. Those are both infected, infectable as well, and they use those alpacas in the lab now for studies. Yeah? Are these these are, the wild ones that are Right, so these are, I believe, all dromedary camels is what they've infected so far, yes. And they were all males. So one of the other things, I'm not telling you the other milk story, but there's um, one of the ideas of the of way people get infected by camels, one of the I, thoughts was that in the Middle East, they drink raw camel milk. So they said, oh, maybe that's the place that you can get MERS from, and people are getting infected that way. Um, and so there was a study, um, again, out of, uh, out of Erasmus, Bart Higman's lab, where they went to Oman, and they did, um, they looked at camel milk. And so uh, I didn't know this, but the way you get milk from camels is you can't just go like a cow, you, know, you can't just go to a cow and start milking the cow, the camel. They take the baby camels and they feed, they go onto the camel, um, the mom camel, and they start milking and it induces the milk production. They pull the baby away and then they milk the camel that way. That's how you get milk. That's what I've learned about camels. Um, so they eat a lot of camel meat as well, right? So they looked in that milk, and they found low level, no virus, but low level RNA for MERS. So the question has always been from that study, um, is it contaminated from the baby camel that they use to induce the milk production, right? Or is it really there? And so they can't, because there's so much protection of the camels in, um, in these countries, uh, what you really want to do is a biopsy of like the milk gland and try to get milk out that way, and they haven't been able to do that study. Um, but potentially, there, there, there's huge, such a huge level of raw milk consumption, raw camel milk consumption in the Middle East, you would think there'd be much, much more infections if that was true. And there, the levels are low enough that's probably not there. Um, uh, I don't know if that was in the study. Sure, right. I don't know if they're, I don't remember in that study if they looked at antibody. I'm not sure. Um, 
they potentially, I mean, if the mom is infected, you should have potentially have antibodies there. Um, I don't know if that study, if I've seen any data on the antibodies in the milk. Yeah. Oh, they sacrificed the camel to, to, to study it after five days of infection. I know, it's a camel. Ooh. Right, so one of the big worries every year during, during, um, during the Hajj is that they're going to have, you know, they have, they have an influx, 20 to 50 million people every year go to the Hajj for um, religious pilgrimage. And the worry is that there's going to be a massive MERS outbreak during that time. So, um, and there hasn't been, which I find remarkable. Um, the, the Saudi government gives visas to everyone individually who's allowed to come. So they, um, they restrict the age. So if you're really old and you're sick, you're not allowed to come. They also have eliminated um, camel sacrifices at the large pilgrimage sites to reduce the amount of potential spread of infectious material, um, infectious virus at those sites. So they've done things to control these things. They have a, they have a, a massive um, infectious disease control network all over Saudi Arabia that um, this guy Zian Memish had pioneered, really. And there's um, dozens and dozens of papers by him understanding uh, infectious disease control during mass pilgrimages. So they're very good at understanding these dynamics, which is good. I, I have talked to many, uh, many uh, someone who says, oh, I know a sheik or I know uh, my cousin's a governor of something, and I have not got there. If anyone knows anyone, I would be happy to talk to anyone. <laughs> All right. So the one really cool thing about, uh, or one of the other cool things about uh, the camel story is that um, uh, this same group looked at where the receptor was in the camel. So we know that the receptor for MERS is DPP4. Um, and so this is, these are, are uh, I know you don't know what you're looking at. These are cross sections of lung tissue uh, or different sections. So this in the top, it's nasal cavity, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. Okay, so this is basically top of the airway all the way down to the deepest part of the lung. Sections of those tissue, and then they use antibodies and they, they stain them. Um, they, they look in the tissue for where this DPP4 protein is. And when you do the technique, the brown, the brown um, dots here are cells that express the DPP4 protein, right? So in camels are on the left and rhesus as a, a, a correlate of humans is on the right. So in camels, what you see is the DP4, the receptor, is all upper airway. It's not, it's very little in the deep lung, in the alveolar space. Whereas in macaques, there's very little in the upper airway, and it's all in the alveolar space and the, and the bronchioles. So the idea is that the camels are getting this snotty upper respiratory infection, like we get a cold, and that's it. And they clear the virus. Where we get a deep lung infection, like very severe flu, and we get really sick and die. And that's at least the theoretical dynamic of what's going on with the the way the virus infects. So the other part of the camel problem was that um, uh, the farmers in Saudi Arabia did not like the idea their camels were responsible for this infection. So they, if you go on, Google, on YouTube and you search um, camel kissing MERS, there's a whole series of videos and reports of people kissing their camels to basically say, look, I kiss my camel every day, and I am not infected. Um, so it's not a camel thing. Don't talk about my camels that way. Uh, I just Googled it. All right, it is true. But there's, in Israel, there's no positive MERS, um, only Saudi Arabia, or in the, in the other parts of the Middle East. Um, so they have looked at other places. So Israel is negative. Australia, which actually has the largest amount of camels in the world, is negative. Um, so Australia breeds camels. They have a massive camel breeding network. And they kill the camels and then ship the meat to the Middle East, because it's, it it's a huge amount of, of meat consumption, camel meat, in the Middle East. And they can't breed enough camels in the Middle East to, um, to the level where they can use them for their own um, for food. Um, and so they're negative there. They're negative in the United States. Canada really seems to be an Africa and Middle East kind of localized issue. OK. Um, so in people um, that are infected with MERS, they get a, a very severe pneumonia-like disease. Up here is the normal lung. Uh, on the left, you can see this airway right here in the circle. This is the alveoli. So you can see these very thin um, tendrils that are here. They connect. And this is where your gas exchange happens in the lung. On the bottom is the one autopsy. There's been two autopsy studies for MERS at all published out of the 2,000 uh, cases. Um, so in these lungs, you can see this looks a lot different than this. This is filled with fluid where there should be gaps where you get air. Um, the, 
alveolar the spaces here, you can see this, there are, um, they're thick, whereas here they're very thin. Um, this thickening, again, reduces airway uh, oxygen and uh, transmission, and they're filled with infl infl in, sorry, inflammatory cells. Um, so all these little blue dots are the nuclei of inflammatory cells coming to the lung, and so your lung is basically filling with a bad inflammation. With liquid fluid, um, constricting airflow, and then you have now a huge inflammatory response, and that leads to this severe disease. So they, they, apparently they do allow autopsies, but not to be shared outside of the family. So there are autopsies being done. I've talked to ID docs in the United States who have consulted there and said, I've seen MERS patients, uh, path samples, but only two have been published. Um, and the reason is because of a religious concern. So they're, all, they're generally all Muslim, um, and uh, they don't share information out. Uh, for South Korea, when that happened, the MERS community thought, OK, we're going to get samples out of South Korea. The worry there by the South, South Korean CDC was that they couldn't control the virus. So they cremated all of the, um, all of the bodies to, so you, couldn't, you weren't sampling them willy-nilly. So there are some samples there for a couple of sputum samples, a handful of blood samples to do studies on, but there's no large level of, of samples there that we can use. OK. Um, so why is MERS so lethal? Um, when they've looked in, this is the uh, leading to work that we've done in the lab. Um, when they looked in, in the number of people that have, been, uh, that have died and have severe disease from MERS, um, what they find is that they, a, lot of, a lot of them have other diseases, other comorbidities. So the major one they have, one is end-stage renal failure, so they're obviously very sick. Um, the other one is diabetes. And so people with diabetes are generally immunosuppressed, which is part of the, which could maybe be the reason they get infected more easily with MERS. Um, one of the interesting things is if you look at the num amount of, um, of diabetics around the world, Saudi Arabia has the largest number of diabetics. Over 20% of the population is diabetic, um, mostly all type 2 diabetics. Um, better than the US. Good at one thing. <laughs> I thought we were there. Um, but uh, so this may be the reason, one of the links, actually, we think is the reason for this huge number of MERS cases in, in Saudi Arabia, specifically. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. In the lab, we have a mouse model for MERS where we, we've, we've treated the mice a certain way so we can infect them with MERS. Um, we made them diabetic. So we feed them basically a cheeseburger diet for 12 weeks. We get them really fat, really diabetic. Um, they have type 2 diabetes, basically, high fat diet fed. And then we give them MERS, and they, look, they have much worse disease than a normal fed mouse. And so we're trying to understand what that is, what the reason for it is. Um, but we know that we can at least mimic that disease uh, in mice that we see in people. No, so the question is why is the, the Saudi Arabia have a lot of intermarriages, inter-family um, marriages? And so that wouldn't be, that would think that would lead more to type 1, where you have genetic linkages there, which we're not seeing. The reports are mostly type 2 diabetes. Um, and the, one of the things in Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of guest workers. And so the Saudis are more the managers, and there's other um, Filipino and other guest workers from Indonesia that come in to um, do a lot of the manual labor. And we think that the idea is that maybe that is the linkage between the um, the high fat diet, the type 2 diabetic kind of developing diabetes there, but that's just a theory. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. So the question is how high fat is camel milk? I don't know how high fat camel milk is. It's, is it more than, than cow milk? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So um, the, this is the bottom half of the figure I showed you before. So for SARS on the top, we think it goes from bats to civets to humans with a chance of going bats to humans. For MERS, we think it goes from, originally probably went from bats, you know, several decades ago into camels. It's now endemic in camels. Um, so I told you before to remember that, that civet cats, they culled the civet cats, right? They blocked them from being sold. So we can't do that for MERS because the camels are, you're not gonna knock out and kill every camel in the Middle East. Um, so you have to be able to block that reservoir somehow because right now, there is continuous spread from camels to humans, and that's how we're getting these outbreaks over and over again. Um, so, and once someone's infected, as I showed you, there they get there's they go to a hospital, and because of whatever comorbidities may be occurring with other patients in the hospital, they get spread to the other patients. And right now, MERS doesn't spread that well. The R not the the love, the transmissibility is under one, so it's usually a dead end infection. It's only the rare cases where you get these outbreaks in the hospitals. So one of the worry, the questions goes back to that graph I showed before about where we are on the SARS curve. 
So are we at this low level early animal infection stage? We're seeing, we're seeing it in humans because we're looking for it. But is it, if it mutates the right way or the wrong way, could it transmit way better between people person to person? And so that's one of the other things we're working in the lab is looking at the evolution of the virus um, and could it evolve ability to transmit better? Um, we don't have any transmission models for coronaviruses in animals, um, at least in small animals. Um, so it's harder to study in that way. But also, potentially developing vaccines for camels would be a way to go about this. You could vaccinate camels when they're born. They then don't get infected. And then you limit the amount of virus that's in the environment to be spread to people. Um, we are working on that. There's a lot of people working on that now. There's been studies in camels. We're doing a study now in alpacas with a vaccine uh, candidate um, that works in mice. Uh, presumably, it'll work in alpacas too. Um, and potentially, once we can prove it's in alpacas, then you can get buy-in from Saudis um, there. The problem is that we've talked to a lot of Saudi um, uh, healthcare or, or animal health workers there. The ability to vaccinate camels is very hard in Saudi Arabia because they're all, um, they all are, if you, if you modify the camel in any way, it's now not perfect and not correct and you can't then sell the milk and the meat and maybe um, it'll reduce the amount of the value of those camels. So unless it comes down a decree from the king to say every, every camel is vaccinated with, again, if anyone knows you, we've got a vaccine for you. Um, if anyone knows anyone there, uh, we could do it. But ultimately, it's going to be a hard buy-in. And so that's part of the future of this story, I think. Yeah. Hmm. So the, the, the bats are probably the original parent reservoir. They probably were there. That's where the virus originally came from, as seems to be for a lot of coronaviruses. But bats, uh, uh, sorry, camels seem to be this um, persistent reservoir now. And that's what we're dealing with now. So it's, it's kind of like, but they don't, they get this, again, this snotty upper respiratory infection. They don't die. If camels were dying from this virus, we would have a lot more money in my life. Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, so the question is, is the transmissibility linked to the low viremia, so the low levels of virus in humans compared to what SARS? Um, we don't have that much data on what the virus levels are in humans for MERS. Um, but in our, at least in animal studies that, we've, that people have done in, in mice or in, in different non-human primate species, um, the levels are still very high for MERS. So it doesn't seem to be that, it doesn't seem to be just replicating better. There's some other transmissibility mutation that's probably gonna have to occur for, um, for it to transmit better. We don't know. So the last little bit, um, so are there other coronaviruses out there and should be worried about them? So um, again, we'll go back to our phylogeny. And so maybe, I don't know, uh, so 10 years, I'll come back and uh, you'll say, see, you said maybe, and we have another one. So all of these other ones that are here, there are bat coronaviruses out here. Like every place they look, there's bat coronaviruses. There's other camel coronaviruses as well. Um, that now that people are looking at camels for MERS, they find a lot of other coronaviruses too. Um, there are hedgehog coronaviruses. There's every animal species, beluga whale, antelope. Every animal species has a coronavirus generally that infects it. Um, and could any of them jump to people is the big question. Uh, and we don't know, uh, or really how to find them. So the last little bit here is that um, uh, there have been new SARS-like strains found in bats. So this is from my former boss's paper. Um, they found in these studies with, with the same John Epstein and, and Peter Daszak, they went and looked in bats. They found um, a SARS-like virus there. They um, didn't isolate the virus. They synthesized it. You can make this virus in the lab using genetic molecular tricks. Um, and we're able to find that it does actually infect using um, the mouse or human receptor humanase 2. So again, it is out there. They've made this in the lab. And you can prove that this exists. And so one of the ideas for um, the way this evolution of the virus is working is that normally we think that there's initial, um, the virus replicates to in, in its own host species, and that there is a very random kind of rare event where you get a mutation happens. And by interacting with this other reservoir, then you can get spread. So basically, this rare event, this, the virus is replicating in bats. There's a rare event that happens there. That absolutely rare event interacts with the, the civet cat in another rare interaction to spread the virus. And that rare event happens from the civets to then uh, interact with people. And one of the newer ideas is that 
um, has been shown for a lot of viruses, is that in a single animal, you get a, a really a kind of a swarm of virus. So the viruses always, these are RNA viruses, they mutate a lot. You get this mutational kind of spectrum the virus can inhabit, and it replicates as this pool, not as a pure 100% identical virus every time, but this pool of virus. And that pool is essentially always evolving. And again, that pool of viruses has a much higher rate of ability to jump to other animals that then could ultimately jump to people. And that is a big worry that, that the more we interact with the environment, the more that we go about our business in the wild um, by taking down uh, uh, forests and um, polluting the planet, we're interacting with them more. And that's kind of a, that is potentially a place where not just SARS and MERS and coronaviruses, but all these other emerging viruses can now jump better. So um, there's a lot of other questions that we don't understand about coronaviruses. Um, one will another one emerge? I'll say yes, I guess. It for SARS, it happened for MERS. Um, there's evidence that it's going to happen again. We just don't know where or when. Um, hopefully in another country this time that has a little more political interaction with the US than either China or the United States or uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, we don't really understand yet how the viruses cause disease. We know these inklings and these hints about what they look like in animals and what they like in people, but not really the fundamental reason why they, they're so lethal. Um, we don't really understand how to control the reservoirs other than culling. We're still working on a lot of therapies, antibodies, and drugs, and um, vaccines. Um, and we don't really understand exactly what the proteins and the viruses do. We've done a lot of studies on uh, what the proteins do in the lab. Um, they, they interact with the immune response. They interact with the host response for wound healing. They interact with all kinds of pathways. And putting that all together, um, after you take a virus apart, is, is hard to understand exactly what's going on. And so I'll leave you this one last picture here. This is the pale blue dot. This, no, this is the um, Earth from Mars. So this is Earth right there. So this is from the lunar rover on Mars. So all of the viruses we've talked about today, every virus that's going to be in the outbreak um, uh, display, every virus that could ever occur is um, on Earth is in this little tiny thing here that causes so much disease and, and death and, and rampant destruction. Um, uh, I find it kind of amazing to think how little that little thing is a lot of the times. Um, so the last little bit is that uh, the American Society of Virology, which I'm a member of, has their meeting this year at College Park in July. If anyone would like to come, you can go to the website, register. You're more than welcome. Anyone can come. So um, we would all love to have you if you want to go. Um, and that's me. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, um, I'm Peterson, Maryland, and that's my email address. And uh, um, if you have any questions, I will take them. Thank you.